you can't deliver elite play, uh, deliver elite tiebreakers. Uh, we're talking ACC Coastal Football. We got Mike McDaniel on the line from uh, ESPN Blacksburg Gobbler Country and his basketball conference podcast. Mike, how you doing tonight? Hanging in there, Mark. How you doing? I am doing just fine. Appreciate you stopping by to talk some ACC football. We focus on the Coastal with Clemson in a safe spot, of course, as they have been since August in the Atlantic. Pitt taking on Virginia Tech, the games in Blacksburg this week. It's not a, a week of a ton of huge games across the nation. Of course, Ohio State, Penn State uh, catches most people's eyes. You've got uh, Georgia taking on Texas A&M. But even in a light week, a lot of people might bypass this one because they look at the records, they look at the rankings, and you're not going to find a ranking next to either team. But if you're looking at championships and uh, who's going to make it to conference championship weekend, you better pay attention to this one because the Coastal Division race is a mess. We're going to get to those scenarios and we're going to let Mike just tear it up on that front. But first, let's talk about this football game because somebody's got to win it. And uh, Virginia Tech, I think people started to give up on this football team a long time ago. And I will raise my hand, uh, especially following that 45 to 10 drubbing against Duke. That seemed to be the, the bottom basement um, spot of the season, but they quickly bounced back, won some critical games and, and kind of outline what's been the difference in the Hokies sprinting out now to a five and two record uh, at rather four and two in the ACC and a seven and three record right now where they look dead and gone just uh, maybe six weeks ago. Yeah, you have games every year where like an elite team gets upset. So let's talk about Georgia, right? Georgia gets upset by South Carolina back in October. And, you know, you look at that game now. I mean, you know, Georgia would win that game by three or four touchdowns, you would think. <clears throat> and, you know, with Virginia Tech, the way they lost to Duke, you know, it was obviously, you know, they had Ryan Willis playing quarterback. It was a different looking offense for Virginia Tech at the time. They were still struggling. They were turning over the football a ton. It's one of those things where, you know, you look at the Hokies and their trajectory from then until now, it really is unbelievable. You know, only with a one point loss to, to Notre Dame uh, since that game. And that was a game in which Hendon Hooker, the new starting quarterback for the Hokies, didn't play because he was injured. Uh, Quincy Patterson came in. Offense was inherently limited. He's more of a running threat quarterback, very raw as a passer. The Hokies passing offense just inherently limited in that in that football game. So, you know, when you look back and you consider Virginia Tech's trajectory since then, they've played so much better on defense. The offense has been so much better. You know, if you could go back and play that Duke game tomorrow, you're thinking with especially with how Duke's played, you know, you're thinking it's 45 to 10 going the other way in favor of Virginia Tech. So it's really crazy how well the Hokies have developed, um, how well they've played under Hendon Hooker. It's hard not to expect Virginia Tech to come out on Saturday. Final game for defensive coordinator Bud Foster in Lane Stadium. They honored him um, in the game against Wake Forest two weeks ago on Bud, you know, what they called Bud Foster Day. Um, they unveiled a banner in his honor. Obviously, he's been an institution at Virginia Tech. Um, he's kind of the last holdover from the uh, Frank Beamer era with the exception of Charlie Wiles, a defensive line coach who was an assistant under Beamer his final few years there in Blacksburg. But, you know, it's an end of an era at Virginia Tech. And, you know, I think the Hokies want to go out the right way at home. Um, obviously, Bud Foster's final game in lane, but it's also senior day. So, you know, I think Virginia Tech wants to get out on the right foot in this football game. Pittsburgh's offense overall doesn't present a lot to necessarily be overly concerned about. But can you pick it, you know, for as much – you know, as much trash as people have talked about him in the past, or, you know, he's a game manager. He turns the ball over too much at times, not as explosive. He, he was explosive in the passing game last Thursday against North Carolina. He was a big reason why they won that football game, um, was able to, you know, stretch the field vertically throwing the football. Uh, Pitt's offense had a more explosive tone to it than usual. It's a big reason why Pitt was able to win that game. So it's not that Kenny Pickett is incapable it's just one of those situations this year in 2019 where, you know, you look at the Pittsburgh offense from a year ago, you had Darren Hall and Caudry Allison at running back. I mean, those are two 1,000 yard backs in your backfield that you lost. You know, they're trying to get by. They have Todd Sibley, who's getting a majority of the carries in the backfield, but it's been a revolving door at running back for Pittsburgh all year. The offense really hasn't been as good running the football as it has been in the past. So a lot more has been put on the plate of Kenny Pickett, who I don't want to say, you know, necessarily can't handle it, but, He's a lot more successful in situations where he can work off of play action and 
he really hasn't been able to do that a ton this year uh, with as much success as he had in the past because Pitt just doesn't have as reliable of a running game. So it's been more difficult for Kenny Pickett, but at times he's been able to extend plays and, you know, make plays down the field. And that's something Virginia Tech obviously will have to be ready for on Saturday. Yeah, the North Carolina game, an entertaining one where Pitt uh, held on for the victory there against the Tar Heels. And we could say the same thing about Virginia Tech if they end up winning this Coastal Division. Circle back to that uh, October game against North Carolina where they won that incredible six overtime game with a number of missed kicks on both sides in the OT session. And of course, the new rule was enacted for the first time so in a historic game i was Indiana, there it was 43 41 you were there yeah it was crazy <laughs> good stuff uh, i saw a stat talking about the uh, pit passing game and um where for about a five-year span under pat narduzzi uh paul chris was probably the coach at the beginning of this run they passed the ball the number of times to rank number 111 in the country in pass attempts for a five-year span coming into this season They've thrown the sixth most passes of any team in the nation. They've completely turned over the offense to Kenny Pickett and, and wide receivers. They've really had they've really had no choice. Uh, real quick on your on the Virginia Tech North Carolina note, that really I felt like that flipped the season for the Hokies. Like they even after a Duke game, they had that game against Rhode Island that they kind of slumbered through. They ended up winning by like seventeen, but it just wasn't really that impressive. Even with Hendon Hooker being the starting quarterback. It didn't really look great in that game, but the North Carolina game, being able to win that game, Hendon Hooker actually left the game. He was hurt. Quincy Patterson came in. Um, Virginia Tech completely changed their offense, ran the ball the entire second half with Quincy Patterson, and they were able to get the job done. That really flipped the season for the Hokies. Um, back to your point about Pittsburgh, though. I mean, they they had to flip that offense out of necessity, um, like we were just talking about, Mark. It, it, it's a situation this year where just the running game for Pittsburgh has not been solid all year. And when you all of a sudden have to change your offense in a way that really hinders the effectiveness of your quarterback or at least puts him in a situation where he's uncomfortable for a majority of the time, it really does change things. And, you know, that's why you see Pittsburgh's offense kind of going in ebbs and flows. There have been you know, some pretty bad games and poor performances. And there have been some really, really good performances, like the one we just saw last week against North Carolina. So it's a mixed bag for the Pittsburgh offense. And, you know, I, I think a reason why Pittsburgh is in the position that they're in in the Coastal Division uh, with an obviously an opportunity to still win the division is because their defense has played better than in years past. You know, Mark, we talked about on the show multiple times about Pat Narduzzi and how good the defense was when he was the coordinator at Michigan State. And, he hasn't really had a defense that's been all that good at Pittsburgh since he's been there up until this year. Now, they're not a great defense, but they're much better than they have been. And I think in a year where you lose so much production at running back, it's so important. It's so paramount that you get production elsewhere. They're getting it on the defensive side more than they have throughout Pat Narduzzi's tenure so far. And they're getting ebbs and flows of that with Kenny Pickett at quarterback. And if you get more than more good than bad with Kenny Pickett, with the way the defense has played overall this year, um, average to slightly above average in some cases, that's going to be enough in a down coastal division to put you back in position to, you know, go back to the ACC championship game where Pittsburgh was a year ago with, you know, what ended up being like a six or seven win record. It, it was not very good for the Panthers a year ago, but they're in position to win the coastal once again. Yeah, the Panthers have a handful of uh, future NFL players on defense. Paris Ford's one of the better defensive backs. Uh, in the ACC, 10 passes defense, 72 tackles for him. DeMar Hamlin, same thing. He's been in the program for a long time, 54 stops this season. Uh, Ford with three picks. Uh, we saw Jalen Twyman show up uh, considerably against North Carolina a number of times in the uh, pressuring um, North Carolina in that one. Sam Howell going down. He's got nine and a half sacks. I believe that's good enough for top three status in the ACC for. Uh, Jalen Twyman. And speaking of Kenny Pickett, uh, I mentioned all the pass attempts. It hasn't converted itself into much production in regards to touchdown interception ratio at 10 to 8, despite throwing 364 passes in 10 games. So he's chucking it 36 times a game, and he's only produced that. Maurice French has 75 catches uh, to lead the way. Uh, I was really impressed with this kid. Uh, Shockey Jacques Louis, who played against North Carolina. This kid uh, hasn't barely seen the box score this year with 12 receptions, but he showed up in a big way last week. I 
think he's a freshman. So I think that gives us something to look forward to with put pit football and, and I'm not able to pull up his numbers, but uh, then we also have, of course, yeah, I'm losing it here. I've, I've got a slow computer. I'm going to cut that out because no problem. I, I'm getting nothing out of, of this trying to pull up stats. It's <clears throat> not helping me out at all. Got Mike McDaniel on the line. You can join him at Gobbler Country. Uh, joins us from ESPN in Blacksburg, where he does some uh, pregame for Virginia Tech football during uh, the season as well. Uh, Mike's talking some ACC football with a monumental uh, ACC coastal clash with Pitt going to Virginia Tech to take on the Hokies. Uh, do you lean one way or the other in this one? I do. Yeah, I, I do lean with Virginia Tech. It's hard to pick against them right now with the way they're playing on both sides of the football offensively it's i mean they're humming in a way offensively that i haven't seen uh in the justin fuente era i mean there were some you know you think back to 2016 and justin fuente's first year as head coach of virginia tech and they had gerard evans at quarterback virginia tech had a very good offense th that year but i haven't seen it like i have this last six games this is this is crazy i mean Hendon hooker the way he's running the football right now the way he's able to facilitate the offense passing the ball as well Virginia Tech's running game from a running back position in the last five or six games is the best I've seen in, in a long time. Um, so offensively, they're very balanced. They're hitting you with a lot of run pass options, jet sweeps, um, runs just straight up the middle with running backs that, you know, honestly, the play calling hasn't really changed a whole lot. It's just working better now. You have more of a threat at quarterback with Hendon Hooker running the football than you had, obviously, with Ryan Willis, and that does definitely play into it. And defensively right now, it's a young unit. You know, you talk about all the defensive linemen Virginia Tech have up front. Very, very young. Freshmen and sophomores in most cases. It was going to be, a, you know, there are going to be some growing pains there on the defensive line. Um, they, they seem to be able to get a better pass rush going now in recent weeks, which is really important. Virginia Tech's now able to rush four or maybe five if they're bringing the heat. And that takes a lot of pressure off of a young secondary you got a guy like Caleb Farley who, you know, took his took his lumps a year ago, had a really, really good game in his first ever college football game a year ago down in Tallahassee against Florida State. Farley had two interceptions in that game. It's still to date probably one of the best games he's played as a Virginia Tech Hokie, and that was his very first game. It set expectations for last year unbelievably high when he was a redshirt freshman to, a, to the point where, quite honestly, it was kind of unfair what a lot of fans were expecting of him, but – you're a victim of your own success at that point. He had a really, really hard time throughout the rest of last year, staying with guys in coverage. He was really struggling there and took his lumps as a freshman, but he's emerged as an all ACC corner. He's certainly going to be first team all ACC a cornerback this year. He's a guy who definitely has all American potential with the way that he's played. If he continues on the trajectory he's on, um, they just don't, I mean, it's getting to the point now where a lot of quarterbacks aren't even throwing his direction, which you know, you talk about DBU at Virginia Tech and Miami talks about it and Auburn and Florida talk about it. Right. But, you know, Virginia Tech's put a lot of defensive backs in the pros under Bud Foster and, you know, Caleb Farley. I know that this is only his second year in the program or his third year in the program, second year playing. But, you know, he's a guy that definitely has NFL potential if he continues on the track that he's on. So Virginia Tech's defense, long story short, it's playing really well right now. It's Bud Foster's last game in Lane Stadium. It's senior day the intangibles go Virginia Tech's way because you're just playing at home. It's it's going to be an emotional game to begin with. Um, weather is not going to be great in Blacksburg, which, you know, with the way Pittsburgh's running the football right now, it's it hasn't been great. Virginia Tech's running the football a lot better than a lot of people expected them to after that Duke game a month ago. Um, I, I like the Hokies to win, Mark. I do think it'll be competitive. I think it'll be low scoring. I think maybe we're talking like, you know, 20 to 13 or – 24 17 i i don't see this getting into the 30s with the way the weather forecast looks and all the external elements i just i see virginia tech winning the game i think it'll be competitive but um this is going to be one of those games that's that's going to come down to a defensive stop at the end or you know who makes more plays in the running game and right now i think you got to lean in virginia tech's favor Mike's good with uh, math and metrics, and we're going to put his brain to the test here so this is the ACC coastal division rundown right now virginia's five and two Pitt and Virginia Tech are four and two. Miami's four and three. Those are the only teams that matter. It could be plain and simple, folks. If Virginia beats Virginia Tech for the first time in 15 years, 
they will win the ACC Coastal at six and two. End of story. That game, I believe, is still the Friday following Thanksgiving, correct? That is correct. Yes. Always look forward to that one. But if Virginia Tech's able, if we skip ahead two weeks and they're able to win that game against Virginia again, then we know that Virginia's five and three. We know Virginia Tech has a fifth win. We don't know what's going to happen between Virginia Tech and Pitt this Saturday, but of course that's a key game. And then Miami's also a bit of a factor at four and three with a game against Duke in two weeks, again, a week from Saturday in their finale at home. So how does it stack up, Mike, if you can possibly lay this out as simply as possible? Yeah, I mean, it's easy for UVA. UVA has Liberty this weekend. They're a 17-point favorite. I can't imagine them losing to Liberty. This isn't like a few years ago when they found a way to lose to Richmond in the opener. This is a little bit different now. Um, so UVA is going to go into Blacksburg with a 5-2 and two conference record, and you know they're going to be looking for their ninth win of the year when – um, when Virginia Tech comes up to Charlottesville. And I, I just can't imagine UVA going into that game against Virginia Tech with a loss to Liberty, right? It's not going to happen. Anyway, it's out of the purview of the – yeah, it, it's out of the purview of the Coastal anyway, right? So um, Virginia win, wins out, right? They win the Coastal very easy, like you mentioned. Virginia Tech wins out, they win the Coastal, right? So that requires beating Pittsburgh this weekend and Blacksburg, going on the road and beating – UVA and Charlottesville will be Virginia Tech's 16th consecutive win if they're able to get it done there on Black Friday. But if Virginia Tech wins out, they win the Coastal. Here's where it gets a little bit dicey, Mark. Let's say Virginia Tech loses to Pittsburgh. That would give Pittsburgh their fifth win in conference play. Let's say Virginia Tech beats UVA on Black Friday. Virginia Tech would now have their fifth win. UVA already has five wins. Let's say Miami beats Duke because Miami's going to be favored against Duke. Miami's a much better football team at this stage than Duke is. Not to say they haven't lost to Duke before, but Miami should beat Duke. That would mean that there are four different ACC teams at five and three, Mark. Then we're playing the tiebreaker game. If that happens... The first rule when you have a four-way tie or even a three-way tie, you look at the records of each individual team against the group, right? So it would be Virginia Tech, Miami, Pittsburgh, and UVA. Virginia Tech and Miami in that scenario would be two and one against everybody else. So if you did a round robin against those, those four teams, Virginia Tech and Miami are two and one against Virginia and Pittsburgh and Virginia Tech, right? So that they'd be two and one. So then that leaves you with Virginia Tech and Miami moving on to the second tiebreaker. The second tiebreaker mark is head to head. Virginia Tech beat Miami head to head back in October, and Virginia Tech would still win the coastal if it was a four way tie at five and three. So Virginia Tech has an excellent chance to still win the division, even if they were to find a way to lose this weekend to Pittsburgh. All they have to do is go on the road, beat UVA, which hasn't been a problem for them the last decade and a half. UVA is a much better team this year than anything Virginia Tech has seen. Virginia Tech needs to beat UVA in the finale. As long as they do that, this weekend doesn't really matter quite as much as it would be in the past, right? If Virginia Tech beats UVA, Virginia Tech owns the head-to-head against UVA. Pittsburgh uh, would have they, – they'd have five wins, but when you look at Pittsburgh, They've lost to UVA, right? So you have even if you have the three-way tie scenario, everybody's five and three. Say Miami found a way to lose to Duke. Virginia Tech would still own the tiebreaker there. They have the best record against the group. So as important of a game as this is for Pittsburgh this weekend, and as important of a game as this is for Virginia Tech, this is still a very important game for the Hokies. You always want to control your own destiny. Virginia Tech can still find a way to win the division should they lose at home this weekend to Pittsburgh. So it's going to be wild down the stretch. I, I'm i banking on there being some sort of tie-break scenario at the end. I think it's more likely than not. It's been the, the way of the Coastal all year long. But Virginia Tech, with the way that they've played over the last month and who they've beaten in their division, 
puts them in an excellent position to still win this division, even if they do lose this weekend to Pittsburgh. I see two other reasonable scenarios to consider here. That would be if Pitt sweeps Virginia Tech and Virginia, that leaves them at six and two. If Virginia beats Virginia Tech, that's why Virginia still wins is because way back in week one, they beat Pitt head to head. So they would win the six and two, six and two battle versus Pitt head to head. However, if Pitt sweeps Virginia Tech and wins their final game against BC and Virginia Tech beats Virginia, then you've got Pitt sitting alone at six and two and they repeat as Coastal Division champions. I mean, it's it's wild. I mean, you're in a position right now where it, it's hard to really tell you if the division is as bad as everybody said it was, or if it's actually a little bit better than expected. I mean, I think if I think it depends on what lens you look at it in, right? I think if you looked at this a month ago, maybe you're thinking something a little bit different. If you said, "Hey, Virginia Tech and Miami," especially with the way Virginia Tech lost to Duke and the way Virginia Tech beat Miami. If you were going to tell me that Virginia Tech and Miami still had a chance to win the division coming into the last couple of weeks of the season, I would have told you that something crazy happened and neither one of the teams were any good. But you can have a scenario where you have multiple eight or nine win teams in the Coastal Division fighting to see who plays Clemson. And it's one of those situations too, Mark, where I think Virginia Tech, Miami, UVA, and Pittsburgh are all playing pretty good football right now. You know, Pittsburgh coming off a huge win against North Carolina. Miami's been a different team since they lost to Georgia Tech. Virginia Tech, obviously, like we mentioned, different teams since they since they lost to Duke. And UVA, they, they kind of had their ebbs and flows in the middle part of the season, but they've been playing well for about a month. So ever since that Miami loss, UVA's been playing much better. So it's a situation where you have a lot, you got four teams in the coastal all playing well right now. They're, they're playing pretty good football, relatively speaking, against themselves. Um, correct. The, the thing that I'll point out in regards to my original expectations was I feel pretty good here, even though it's not close to the scenario that I, I foresaw, but I picked Virginia to win the division in eight and four. And I had Miami at eight and four. I believe I had Virginia tech either eight and four or seven and five. The, the team that surprised me has been Pitt. Uh, yeah. I think I had them with five wins, if I recall, but the, the rest of it lines up pretty closely to what I saw.